our current mission makes a nice change from temporal directives and military patrols. This time we're simply exploring alongside the Lucari and their first deep space exploratory vessel, the Warp 4 Concordia. Captain Kumaki is taking the lead, while we on the Armager appointed by Starfleet effectively chaperone for the mission. Are you seeing this? My sensors indicate this planet is completely devoid of any organic material. And yet, it has a breathable atmosphere and lies well within the system's habitable zone. Most curious. I'm picking up residual levels of radiation. Oh my. I believe I know what happened to this world. Some kind of protomatter wave happened here. Protomatter? But that's unstable! Not if you know how to resolve the chaotic turbulence with a tarfine reduction. Oh. This was a recent event. Some kind of protomatter incident happened. And it wiped out all life on the planet. I think we should send an away team down to learn more. Protomatter is a very unstable substance, but its potential benefits in terraforming and such make it subject of continual study, even in Starfleet. During the 23rd century it saw use in Project Genesis as part of the ill-fated Genesis device, but was frankly the key component in rendering the terraformer unstable. If added to a star, it can also interfere with its natural life cycle, such as reigniting a dying one or detonating a supernova. It's also a very powerful source of energy, but because of its volatile nature, it's often disregarded by a lot of species, just when things like antimatter reactions are far more controllable. It seems Kumaki may be aware of a way to at least theoretically work with the temperamental protomatter though. The area, despite the protomatter, should be safe to set foot on, so we beam down to investigate. Oh, not sure I'll ever get used to transporters. Let's see. Initial scans suggest this area used to be inhabited, but I can't find a single trace of organic matter. None. I see some carvings on those canyon walls. Let's take a look. Yeah, and aside from the carvings, there's also that very unnatural pillar over there. Well, this world is certainly desolate, and aside from us, it very much appears to be dead. A whole dead planet of just sand and rock. If there was a protomatter event here, as readings do indicate, then it very much could be the cause of the lack of organic matter. For the planet to have sustained a Class M atmosphere without any forms of plant life is rather strange. Not unheard of, as oxygen can be produced from a breakdown of carbon dioxide by UV rays over a long period of time, but the present signs of intelligent life seem to belie that. Wind sweeps over these sheltering edifices all around us that protect the dust from its effects and being kicked up too much. It feels like we're the only ones here. We're disturbing this tomb of a world. We approach this pillar, our unease growing as we examine it, bleached light filtering in from above. And slightly further ahead from our position we also catch signs of some stairs. There definitely was life here, a civilization at some time. The walls of this canyon were worked by tools, I'm sure of it. Sentient life forms lived here, until the protomatter detonation. This pillar here, it seems to be a sign pointing to that canyon. Perhaps a pathway there leads to a settlement of some kind. I'm reading metallic objects there as well. Shall we take a look? Kamaki, take your eyes from your scanner a minute and actually look around the corner. There's an entire staircase around there. And I think this is just an ornate lamppost, judging by the fallen razor and snapped chains. Look, there's some kind of large structure further down the canyon. Alright, fine. One for one on perception checks. We make our way across these worked stone stairs bracketed by egg-shaped ornamentation. The stone here seems a different colour from the surrounding rock. It's either imported or mined from the floor we're walking on. Either way, we're seeing signs of metal and stonework. Look at the size of that plaza. No small feat of masonry. These people must have had quite a developed culture. Let's take some readings up there. We approach this red and sand rock structure, noting more eggs shaped ornaments. However, fresh footprints catch my eye. But giving a scan, there still are no life signs except for ours. This looks like a town square or ceremonial centre of some kind. I see some murals on the far side of the square over there by that arch. I'd like to examine them. They might tell us more about this place. 
Agreed. Let's poke around some. Although, be careful. These prints don't look that old. They've not been disrupted. As we proceed, we can see that the red slabs on the floor are in fact overlaid on the canyon's surface. So, as none of the rock in this canyon is of the same type as the surrounding stone, that means all this stonework was imported, which in turn means an infrastructure of trade, roads, and civilization. All of which is gone. We approach the daunting entry to this structure, a place of importance probably from its scale and decoration, plus it seems removed from other shelters and we've seen no other dwellings nearby, so perhaps it's a temple or form of castle? These carefully constructed mosaics are inscribed with a language I don't recognise, but they also bear more of the egg-shaped designs, as well as a measurement of lunar phases, time cycling by. The one on the right hand side shows a bunch of people seemingly being commanded to bring eggs to this location. These murals depict people bringing some objects to this place. Crystals or gems, I believe? They built their settlement around this site. I believe it was a place of great significance to them. The next mural may hold more clues for us. Let's have a look. Yeah, you say crystals, I still say they look like eggs. This mural depicts the construction of this large structure. I suspect it was a temple or a place of contemplation for the people. The crystals were revered by the locals, perhaps even worshipped by them. We'd better have a look at the next mural, don't you think? The crystals depicted in this mural appear to be growing for some reason. Or eggs. I wonder if this is a symbolic or literal representation of events. Perhaps the structure needed to be modified to hold the volume of crystals they collected over the years. So we're thinking this is a repository for all of these objects? Quite the enigma we found here. I suspect there's more to be found inside. Getting there will be a challenge, however. According to my scans, these pillars are connected to some kind of massive mechanical structure. Probably the peak of technology for these people. I believe it's some kind of opening mechanism for the structure's door. Ah, <gasps> ancient temple puzzle. Okay, okay, first off, let's try the easy thing. Can we override something with our tricorders? We could probably force it open, but that could damage the structure, and too much force could even collapse it entirely. I suggest we create a holographic forensic reconstruction. I'm usually in favour of the simple solution, but sure. Yes, it would be based on analysis of things like footprints, wear patterns, and local construction. We can learn what people did here, how they went about their lives, and how they made the device work. We'd be watching a replay of history, roughly speaking. Let's start by gathering information from relics and leftover traces of the people who once lived here. Shouldn't be too difficult, doesn't look like anyone managed to pack up their belongings before they vanished. These artifacts were used with opposable thumbs and indicate a likely hand span of 22 centimeters. You certainly have an eye for numbers, don't you? Based on these footprints, these people had a stride that places them at about 1.6 meters on average. Huh, so just slightly shorter than your average human. The wear patterns here show us that people leaned against here frequently. This was a meeting and gathering area. Strange. These relics should be covered with dust and sand, worn away by time and wind. But they're all uncovered. No organic matter left and everything left behind in its place. Frozen in time, like... Like it was just yesterday. Yes. The evidence seems clear. The proto-matter detonation happened only weeks, perhaps even days ago. We're going to need to make an accurate simulation to continue our studies here. I suggest using modified pattern enhancers to do this. Alright, why is it that the recentness makes this far more uneasy? Until now, I thought this was a relatively ancient place we were walking around. Enhancers online. The signal is strong and clear. Strange, isn't it? Thousand years, a hundred years pass and it's just ancient history, but a couple of days or a week and suddenly it's a murder site. Two down, two to go. I guess with it being recent, there's more chance of figuring out what happened, so I guess that's a plus. That's three. One more and we'll be ready. That's the last one. All enhancers online and standing by. Alright, 
The enhancers should give us a pretty good image range. Your tricorder can then act as the center of the network control for the enhancers. I can tie in my data to your tricorder whenever you're ready. Get a little close to the center of the square so we can see what happens. With us already in position, we activate our tricorder and use the displaced molecules and accumulated specifications to recreate the environment. We frankly don't have enough information to actually look at any of the features on the native species here, but we get a general idea of their form. Note that the alien is using the pillars in a specific order. Whilst all around the edge are onlookers and worshippers, so yeah, this place is a temple for sure. Or possibly an aerobics court. They're making the murals match up on each pillar. This place was guarded as well. Whatever has kept it, those crystals or eggs, very important to them. We watch for a bit longer as the central figure completes his meddling with the pillars and heads into the temple. Looks like some kind of functionary, priest or bureaucrat I think, would unlock the door by turning the murals on the pillars. The top mural on each pillar seems to be locked in place for reference. We should follow the order they used on the pillar murals. If we can turn them correctly, I believe we'll unlock the door. Okay, I'll start with this one over here. Let's have a look. Said they could rotate them. They certainly do rotate. Wait, no, we've got to do it in a particular order. Rushing over to the first one we saw the priest work with, we can see the top one is the beginning of a ovaloid egg crystal. So we align the other two pieces to match up. You hear that? That's the first pillar set in place. Retracing the priest's steps diagonally across this open area, we can see that the next one is a person carrying one of these objects. That's two pillars set into place. Three pillars are locked in now. And the last one resembles the patterns we saw on the lanterns coming up here. That's it! It's working! Well done! Shall we see what secrets this building holds? I think I see another mural inside the doorway. We should take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see it too, and I'm not willing to write it off as coincidence. As we reach the now open doorway to the structure, we're confronted with a very austere recreation of a Starfleet Delta. The emblem is seemingly made from solid gold or some metal like it. Isn't that the symbol of your Starfleet? Mm -hmm. How did it get here? Mm -hmm. How could it be in a temple of people who don't even have electricity, much less space travel? This is getting stranger by the minute. We should search the temple for more murals. <sighs> Rounding the bend, we're soon presented with another disturbing image. Several of these planet's natives chaperoning three individuals, one in a gold uniform, one in a blue uniform, and one in a red uniform with black trousers, meeting with this planet's officials. Those look like Starfleet officers. Those people in the picture, they don't look like the others. No, they're Starfleet, 23rd century uniforms, 2250 to 70 sometime by the look of it. What happened here? If Starfleet officers contacted this civilization in the past, why wouldn't you have a record of it? We should head deeper into the temple and continue our search. We would definitely know about this already if this was official. I do not like the look of this. I think the panel on the wall here can be pushed to open something. Then push it. Fine, but if it's booby trapped, you've got to say something nice at my funeral. Those inner doors across from the panel are opening. Wow, those certainly do look like eggs. Oh, okay, they're crystals. We enter into a natural cavern behind the temple, a single shaft of light scattering off a deposit of oval crystal structures as depicted in the mosaics. What is all of this? This is a vault for all of these purple crystals. They've all been brought here and affixed or grown here? We start a scan to see what we're dealing with. 
According to my tricorder, we've reached Ground Zero. This is where someone detonated the protomatter bomb. From here, a self-propagating cascade of proto-energy radiated outward in all directions, washing over the entire planet. So, with Starfleet involved, my mind instantly springs to terraforming. It was used for that purpose. Doubtful. I believe what did this was built specifically as a weapon. There's no new ecosystem. All life was eliminated. I'm picking up a residual energy signature here. Take a look. 16 centimeter wavelength with a slight kaon leak. I've seen this before. It's a byproduct of Zenkethi technology. Wait, Zenkethi? Zenkethi, apart from being one of the few species to stumble across the Dukari, are a species that Starfleet has a bumpy history with. Whatever unfortunate events have unfolded here, the Zenkethi and Starfleet are both involved, and it seems to have led to the destruction of this civilization. Coinciding with our discovery here, the Armager calls in that they have stumbled across a 23rd century Starfleet station in orbit of the planet previously hidden in the ring system. We perform a site-to-site -site transport, just as another ship enters the system to stake a claim to it. We order the Armager to protect the Lucari vessel, while we board the derelict for answers. It's always strange stepping aboard these old stations. As a 23rd century captain myself, it's a bit like coming home, except everything's slightly different than you remember it. Although Tomet, with us also from the 23rd century, recognises the layout and a plaque nearby confirms it. This is Station K-13. Station K-13 was in the third episode of the story series, and saw the vessel become a target from the Nakul in the Temporal Cold War. It was back then that Daniels revealed himself to us as a time agent, and alongside Scotty, we saved the station from neural parasites. However, in disrupting the Nakul's temporal shielding, Scotty accidentally created a rift in space-time. Some of the station's crew was evacuated, but not all, and the space station vanished into the tear. There she goes! I don't think anyone's ever seen a station do that! <laughs> Hello, old friend. Tomet used to be stationed here as well. This is where we picked you up, remember? You're trespassing! I'm claiming this station as salvage, along with everything in it. A little piece of history like this will be quite the vacation site. Experience life on the final frontier at Modron's K-13. But I digress. Unless you're here to discuss leasing opportunities, I suggest you off my station. Leasing opportunities, indeed, that is precisely what I'm here for. Come down and talk to me about it. Careful, this old beauty needs some serious repairs. It'd be a shame if something happened to you, or the active stasis pods my friends found on board. There are stasis pods on board? If anything happens to them or their occupants, Diamond, see it's more menacing if I just leave the threat hanging. Fair warning. My Nostican guards aren't very fond of intruders. Well, that's okay, because I'm not very fond of Nostican gu- Wow. No, that sounded better in my head. So, it seems the other vessels entering into the system was Madron with probably some Nostican backup. Great. As we round the corner, we spot some of his guards. I'd be happy to sell the parts to you. Consider their living contents a... Promotional bonus. We storm the room ahead, taking the Norsicans unaware as they try to reactivate the station by punching it. With them all stunned, we're free to look around at what they were trying to ransack. Chief Engineer's Log, March 18th, 1570. Had a discussion this morning with security about our Klingon prisoners in the brig. We can't just leave them locked up, or execute them, or exile them on the planet below. Setting them free isn't a popular notion either. We're still looking for options, but I think the stasis pods we have in medical will come in handy real soon. 1570. Is in the 16th century this station has been in orbit of this planet for over 840 years. 
Scavrin notes how things were made to last in the 23rd century, and as living proof of that himself I'm sure it is said with no small amount of pride. It looks like the Norskins managed to restore a small amount of power to some of the functions of this station, and were able to access another log. Chief Engineer's Log. Supplemental. By my account, we've been hurled back in time to the 16th century. To make matters worse, we're a very long way from the Deneva system. None of our shuttles are warp capable, and even if we could get to Earth, we'd be in the wrong time. In short, we're stuck. There's nothing to do now but wait and try to conjure up a way to get back to the right time. Scavrin notes that the computers have lost networking, so we'll actually have to go to the main computer core itself to regain control of the station. The fines for trespassing are quite severe, and I plan on collecting them. That's convenient because we do too. Working our way through the degraded corridors, we do encounter several more Norsicans out on patrol, and we take care of them as quickly as possible. Honestly, I'm a little sketchy on Starfleet's rules of salvage, but as far as I see it, this is a Starfleet station, there are still Starfleet officers on board, and we're currently working alongside someone who was formerly posted here. Therefore, Mardron can get his greedy little mitts off of the station and return its still living crew to us. On top of that, I, you know, kind of have a duty as a temporal agent to clear up things like this. We reach a research lab, and the first thing we notice are the stasis pods lining the walls, all of which are occupied by officers of the station. Temet sets about locking out the Norsicans from these controls and other areas of the starbase, while we uncover another log. Chief Engineer's Log, April 17th, 1570. Today we visited the planet we're calling Draconis III to collect supplies. The good news, there's a humanoid civilization down there. Bad news? A potential Prime Directive violation. Our landing party was seen beaming in by some of the locals. We're hoping that doesn't impact their culture in any way. One thing's for sure, they can't help us go home. Their tech level is Bronze Age at best. By the looks of things, a Prime Directive violation occurred anyway. After locking down the computers, Scavrin mentions the Central Control Hub might be the next step. Trying my patience is going to cost you dearly! Before we go, we check on the occupants and they all seem to be alive. We see someone wearing captain's stripes, several lieutenants and many ensigns, but they all seem to be... ticking on by. Our inspection does yield up another log entry, however. Chief Engineer's Log, August 6th, 1570. The Warp Booster Sled Project is officially a bust. When we tried to spin up the coils, we couldn't get a stable warp field. Yashvi and Arlington managed to shut it down and stop a breach, but the shuttle's impulse drive is shot. I hate giving up, but we just don't have the parts we need to make it work. So it does sound like they tried a lot of solutions to try to get home, even just get out of the system. But it doesn't sound like anything really worked. Sprinting down the corridor, we make for the central control hub where the last of the Norsicans are. This battle is a little tougher, the open area not really great for a firefight, so we retreat into the corridors and beam in reinforcements from the armature. At one point, Hale takes a rather nasty hit and I think he's done for, but fortunately the Norsekins don't chase us round the corner and we're able to take them out. Mardrin and his chief security officer are still captured in a corner office, so while they're there we help ourselves to the rest of the logs. Chief Engineer's Log, July 26th, 1571. Most of us went into stasis this morning. There weren't enough pods for everyone. Three of us had to stay awake. We drew lots, and Tavon, Sheridan, and I were the lucky winners. Since we're out of options, we've decided to go native and live out our lives under Conus III. Hopefully, one day our records will be found, and the people of Station K-13 Position 431. When the shooting starts, let the mercenaries handle it. Handle this, Captain! The Prime 
Norse trespassing. The second is bad. With the rest of the Norsicans down, the captain of this team attacks us. Marjorie must be paying him very well because the odds are really not in his favour. With him stunned on his ass, Nulia calls in to report that Norsican vessels are approaching the Concordia. Before we leave, however, we can find one final log at the rear of the central hall. Chief Engineer's Log, July 9th, 1571. It's decided. Most of us are going into cryo sleep. Those who stay awake, well, there's the rub. Going to live on a remote part of the planet below is likely, despite the Prime Directive issues. Staying here isn't viable. When the supplies are gone and the remaining power is in the stasis pods, anyone left is a goner. This station will be their tomb. So it seems the survivors were left with no choice. It was either stay here and die, or go down to the planet and try to live out a life away from the natives and not interfere too much, but despite what their intentions may have been, we've seen clear signs that interference did occur. Having a temple built with a Starfleet monument inside, things clearly didn't go according to plan. It's certainly surreal coming back here and seeing it like this. In many ways, this is the station where Hale's journey effectively began. It was here he first became a temporal agent and got involved in the Cold War, here that he first recruited to Met. In many ways, while not the direct cause of this, it is literally his past coming back to haunt him. I see you took out the Nausicans on my station. I'll just add their fees to your town. I do hope you're good for it. Otherwise, I might have to take possession of that pretty ship of yours. Come to think of it, I'll be taking your ship anyway. Whether you're alive or not when I do, up to you. You're taking my ship. That's just downright theft from Starfleet. That's you're done. What unfolds next is a skirmish against the Diamond's Nandi class vessel and several siphon frigates that launch small drones to tap our energy supply. During the skirmish, however, we can handle ourselves just fine, but we have to keep an eye on the Concordia. It's nowhere near as robust as the Armager. However, Kumaraki did mention how Starfleet has been sharing a lot of technology with the Lucari in preparation for supposed Federation membership, which included deflector shielding, so they're a bit hardier than perhaps we give them credit for, because we see them weather quite a few blows. Not my engines! Those cost me more latinum than your worth! Naturally, after disabling the Damon's ship, he calls in more reinforcements, this time a Norsecan Siphon Frigate and a battlecruiser. As the larger Norsecan vessel starts to prey on the smaller Concordia, we sweep in from behind and blow it to pieces. With that, Madron flees and we add him to the very official Starfleet shitlist. That was quite an adventure. I knew Madron was greedy and treacherous, but I never thought he was willing to kill to get what he wants. In spite of that, I feel like we've learned so much out here, and for the better. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what life out here is like nowadays. There's a lot of exploration and discovery, and that's wonderful, but... Frequently, there is a lot of skirmishing involved, too. Indeed. I'd say our first flight was a success. Now we need to share our discoveries with everyone back home. I hope today's events will convince my people of the continued need to explore and to be part of the galactic community. With luck, we'll do this again sometime, and soon. On behalf of the Lucari people, thank you. No probs, and I am sure Starfleet will continue to be willing to help. As we prep to leave, the crew discusses their findings. This bodes some serious investigation ahead. The Prime Directive violation needs clarification, as the Starfleet crew, stranded in the 16th century, seem to have definitely contaminated the culture below. At least that's how it looks. But on top of that, we have evidence that the Zenkethi are the ones that deployed a protomatter weapon on Draconis III. 
I'm happy to hear the Lucari handled their first experience with space exploration well. There's talk of their desire to join the Federation, and from what I'm seeing, they'd be fine members. The mystery of Station K-13 has been solved, although the past violation of the Prime Directive by some of its personnel is a concern. Hopefully the crew preserved in stasis pods will be able to shed a little more light on that situation. Finally, this news of a Zenkethi protomatter weapon is disturbing. I'll be looking into it from all angles, diplomatic and military in particular. We've fought a war with them before, and I'd prefer avoiding another now. Yes, the Zenkethi have been quiet for a long time, and they pretty much sat out the Iconian War, but they have clashed with Starfleet in the early 24th century. But dealing with these problems will have to come in a later episode of the story series as new frontiers lie ahead and we continue to explore the ever-changing narrative of Star Trek Online. I've been Rick, thanks for watching this and I hope to see you back for the next part. Until then, thanks again and goodbye.